Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Claire. Hello, everybody. I'm an alcoholic, and my name is Craig. Um, sobriety date is 11-28-98. My home group is the Mighty Purpose and Rhythm Group. We meet on Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It is a virtual group. You're all welcome to attend. Uh, I do have a sponsor and a service sponsor. And uh, Tamara and Broken Elevator Group, uh, thanks for having us. Um, It's always an honor to speak at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Um, And over the years, I've had the opportunity to do that in a format with my wife, my mom, Stephen, my stepson, which, I mean, I've done a lot of things in AA, traveled to a lot of countries, served in a lot of different roles. And, I mean, to come from the devastation of alcoholism and the family of alcoholism like I do and to be able to sit here and share about the freedom of AA and and, and other 12-step programs we cooperate with, I mean, there's just no bigger honor. Uh, So thank you. And Stephen, great job. Thank you for sharing your experience, strength, and hope with us. You know, it's it's our instinct to look at Stephen um, or anyone young and be like, Oh my God, he's so special. He's young. And, 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 you know, they did that to me when I was new in a, but the, but the thing is the way we look at it is, is no matter what age you are, we are just as sick. And no matter what age you are, we have the same opportunity to be well. And of course, Stephen's a smart, intelligent, special kid. And he did a great job speaking and, and he touches me to, to hear uh, him talk about a relationship. But I just think for us, it's important to understand that alcoholism hits you no matter what age you are and, and that illness hits you and, and that solution can hit you as well. Um, I certainly remember what I was going through at six years old, five, six years old. I was in the back of my first New York City cop car at five. Um, the parties that I was stuck in, the the blasphemy that I saw at, at, at parties and stuff because I grew up in an alcoholic family you know, distorted, it talks about in our big book, uh, warped lives of blameless children, et cetera, et cetera. I, I identify with that. I identify with that. You know, we, we think about, you think about the topic of the meeting today, it's just practice these principles on our affairs. And, and, and most of us uh, would, would think of the 12 step. And most of us think of the 12 step as sponsorship and sponsorship is just such a small part of the 12 step. I mean, for me, being the self-centered alcoholic, I am, not I was, I am, uh, it took a long time to get right with work and home. Actually, let me rephrase that. It took a long time to even get a job and then to get right with work and home. You know, that's, that's, that's what I dealt with. I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous at 19. I didn't know how to hug. I didn't know how to love. I didn't really understand respect other than, than a, a couple of principles coming from the streets. Um, I had served time. I was in countless institutions. Most of my visits with my mom were behind a glass window or at a treatment facility or center or a family day or her bringing underwear to the jail. Um, that's what had become of my life. That's, that's where, I, where I got to. And, and, you know, all because of alcohol and alcoholism. I grew up in a family where, you know, my grandmother died and she was yellow when we died and we called it diabetes. You know, we didn't, we didn't call it cirrhosis of the liver. Um, I grew up in the, in the eighties and nineties, you know, and, and, you know, it's a different world today, but back then, I mean, I had a couple of uncles that, that were gay and, you know, in the eighties and stuff, you didn't really talk about gay being gay, if you remember, but we were talking about gay all day before we talk about drinking, you know, and, and most of the women were the, were the control freaks as Steven put it, or the, the folks trying to manage the family, but we had alcoholics that were male and female, uh, man, man or woman, and but most of them were the men uh, dying early. Like I never met my grandfather because he died because of alcoholism before before I could meet him. Uh, my other grandfather wasn't around because of his drinking. My grandmother, as I just mentioned, died died early. My other grandmother um, used to send me five dollars, you know, every month with a card and tell me how wonderful my father was. And I was like, I don't understand what you're talking about, Grandma. I haven't seen my father. He doesn't show up. I'm always sitting on the stoop waiting for him. So what are you talking about? He said, oh, no, no, he's a good guy. He's a great guy. 
because that's what we do. We try to fix everything. We try to make, make sure everything's okay when it's not. Um, you know, and, and my father was a New York City fireman and, you know, he had all these awards and he was on the news and, you know, he's such a great guy, but, but he couldn't pay child support, which was only a hundred dollars a month back then. And he couldn't, he couldn't show up to pick me up, which, which really damages you as a person, you know, which really touches me because if you knew and saw, and I know Steven did a good job painting the picture, but if you saw what it was like when Steven and I first met or, or when my wife and I decided to live in the same house with, with her two children, my two stepsons and, what that was like and what it's like now that's solely because of the steps. No other reason. If it wasn't for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, that relationship wouldn't exist. Steven may not be in al My wife may not be in Al-Anon. My, my mom might not be in Al-Anon. I may not be sober. The friends that Steven mentioned uh, who also happen to be sponsees. I mean, when, when Steven was going through those, those steps, um, obviously there's certain things he didn't want to have to talk to his stepfather about. So those kids, uh, I mean, those guys, those men, my sponsees helped him and hurt his fifth step. And that's what we do. We practice these principles in all our affairs. I mean, this, this meeting today isn't about how AA members sponsor our team members. It's just the way it fell for us. But what I'm talking about here is about how members of Alcoholics Anonymous show up in the community, no matter what. Steven talks all the time about one of my sponsees and, and, and friend uh, Ryan, who traveled an hour just to watch 15 minutes of Stephen's concert, you know, because that's the relationships we have. That's what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. We, we make things right, and then we do more than that. You know, we exceed expectations only with the help of that 11th step. Um, I, I can't imagine waking up. I mean, you know, Stephen mentioned it already, but like, I, I don't know, I don't know what's more insane me taking a drink or being here in Alcoholics Anonymous and not working the 12 steps. I really, I really don't know which one's more insane. Uh, understanding, not trying to be funny, but understanding the repercussions of both, you know, and, and I'm sure folks on this call, much like myself, know plenty of people or have gone to plenty of funerals or wakes of folks that did not have a drink inside their system when they blew their head out or did not have a drink inside their system when, when they decided to, you know, to make the ultimate sacrifice. And I don't know what goes on the death certificate, but in my experience, that's alcoholism. That's the effects of untreated alcoholism. So this is a pretty serious, fatal, progressive illness, in case you haven't already known that, which I'm sure you do. And I love the name of the group. I hate the idea of a broken elevator, by the way. I hate it. I, I ride the elevator in New York City all the time. I hate the idea of being stuck in an elevator because I'm claustrophobic, but I love the idea of what we're saying here. Uh, the elevator is broken. Let's go ahead and take the steps. I mean, yeah. I mean, what else is there really to do, right? And that's, that's what happened to me by the time I, by the time I came out close to What else was there to do but to take the steps? I had no choice. I already shared with you some of the things that were, were going on and, and happening. So, you know, alcohol beat me up very early and very quick. And like I told you, I was surrounded by alcoholism. And, you know, there's, there's folks that had no idea because it goes generations and generations, right? So yeah, sure. I was mad at my mom for a while when I was first trying to get sober, but what alcoholic isn't mad at anybody who, who sticks around, you know, we just use them as punching bags or I'll speak for myself. I use them as punching bags. I used them as punching bags. Um, but really, my mom did everything she could in the world that she grew up in. And, you know, if you were to hear her story, there was a couple of moments where somebody had recommended Al-Anon or al but she never made it to there. But there wasn't many until it was later on. So I'm very grateful for this program, which is another reason why I, I can't fathom not giving back. I can't fathom not showing up. I can't fathom saying no to the sponsee that wants help. I can't fathom saying no to the correctional facility that needs a speaker or the treatment committee that wants someone to come to, you know, you name it, fill in the blank. I just can't fathom saying no to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm not talking about being the speaker at a really cool group. I'm talking about, you know, service and sponsorship. I can't fathom saying no. I mean, without it, I'm nothing. But also, if somebody just left me hanging, I may not be here. You know? And the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is perfect in my experience. The people aren't, of course, but that's why we have traditions and concepts and group conscience and, and stuff of that sort. 
So yeah, I'm very touched to hear Steven even put me in that category. And I've never, I've never made Steven call me, you know, his dad or, or truly try to take the place of his father or any of that. But because of these 12 steps and because of all of that stuff, we, we build a relationship and we're able to talk about stuff, you know, we're able to talk about visiting this group and carry the message. We're able to talk about, you know, programs cooperating. We're able to talk about how we're going to help gather some food in the community and feed the homeless. We're able to talk about how we're going to help mom and what we're going to do for her birthday and, you know, fill in the blank. Again, practicing these principles in all our affairs. It's pretty easy um, in AA to behave for an hour, right? It's very easy to behave for an hour. Well, actually, it wasn't easy in the first year, but, but after the first year, it was very easy for me to behave for an hour. But what about those other 23 hours in the day? And, and what about, like I said, at the job? What about at the home? And that's where it really matters. That's where we make the biggest difference in my experience. Again, sponsorship for those that know me absolutely is a big deal, but I still think it's very small part of the 12 step. And I sponsor one less than I need. If I told you how many I had, you wouldn't even believe me. But, and I'm only saying that to make a point that of course, sponsorship is important, both in the, in the realm that I am sponsored and I continue to ask for help. And also in the realm of me carrying the message to sponsees and working with them. But it's really about, what we do to work through problems at home, what we do to work through problems in our family, what we do and how we show up for people that aren't necessarily nice to us, that don't necessarily do uh, what we want or, or live up to our ideals and truly show the power of the program in that way, truly show the power of what these principles can do and, and in turn, you know, be attractive and give us that opportunity. And, and, and I'm only saying this, you know, because, you know, Stephen's here today and, and we're, we're talking a little bit about our family and stuff, but, but a lot of those things came because you guys gave me the program. You know, one, one of my aunts who's uh, violently atheist, like, I mean, like just there's no way there's any existence of any higher power or God on this planet, um, anti-religion, anti-anything to do with any kind of spiritual stuff. After she, because she knew me obviously while I was drinking, but after she saw me in AA for a while, she would call me up and she would talk to me about her issues. And she would say, you know what, Craig, maybe there is something out there. I've, I've seen what it's done for you. Can you share with me a little bit? And, you know, my aunt's probably um, of all my family outside of my immediate family and my mother. I'm probably, you know, very, I'm not probably, I am very close to my aunt because of that experience we had. And we would have never had that if it wasn't A for, the, you know, the amends nice to have amends and B if it wasn't again for carrying this message and practicing these principles in all our affairs. Dr. Bob said it best, carry the message and sometimes use words. It's really all about what we do, not what we say. It's easy to say stuff. At the end of this meeting, I can say the same thing to Stephen. He could say the same thing to me if we don't continue to work the program. Yeah, you sounded real nice, but look at how you're behaving right now. So, I mean, we, we both need to continue to work this program, to continue to bring to the family, to continue to bring to our respective 12-step organizations. <clears throat> the 11th step for me um, is something that I've tried to bring. Like, I've asked my family, um, and, you know, that's Stephen, PJ, my other stepson, Marissa, my wife, my mom. I've asked for us to either go places when we're hiking or right here at the house to take some time and meditate together and take some time and reflect and, and review our day. And, you know, what, what we used to do in the morning often was we would bring down our reading. So I'd have the daily reflections, which as you know, is a piece of a literature and Stephen would have his one or two books, the blue book and the red book from Alateen. And my wife, Marissa would have like 17 books from Al-Anon. Um, and we would, we would pick some readings and, uh, we would share in those readings. Yeah, I know, Stephen. We, we, would, we would share in those readings, and we would share our vision for the day, and we'd talk about how we relate and, you know, really trying to bring that, that experience, strength, and hope. And again, like, what an honor. When you grow up in a home when you have no idea what's true or false, when, when you engage in the self-imposed crisis of alcoholism and drink yourself to oblivion, and you have the the inability to stop drinking on your own and you end up in 17, 18 institutions and you end up incarcerated multiple times and 
supposed to do 15 years in prison and you get the gift to be able to get out. And, you know, you go through all of that. And then here you are sitting in a, you know, in a household where recovery is possible. I feel an obligation. You know, if anybody's new here in AA, you're not obligated to do anything but to show up to Alcoholics Anonymous and, and to choose your own conception of a higher power and choose your own spots or choose your own home group. But I'm just saying, for me, I feel obligated. Again, much like Dr. Bob talks about in his story, the way I've been touched and what I've seen, I feel obligated to share that with others, to make myself available, to, to, to continue to give, you know. What's the point if I have it just for me? And that's why service is so important. Stephen touched on it. If all I've done was come to AA and I've stopped drinking and now I got a million dollars in the bank and a beautiful car and a beautiful wife and beautiful kids and a cool home group and lots of friends where I go to the diner on a Sunday morning on the beach and I put my feet up and everything's great. What, what have I really done? But make it about me again. I was nothing without that program. I am nothing without that program. So it's, it's really, I really live to, to give back. And again, that's not required of you if you're coming to AA, but that's how I feel. I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, especially through the fourth step, that my teachers lied to me. My teachers kept telling me, go find out who you are. And what a lie that was. In Alcoholics Anonymous, I learned that you can create who you want to be. You find in that fourth step who you are and who you're not, and then you ask for the power to be that person. And I was able to create these ideals. And I don't have to settle for the norm and I can question and I can research and I can ask and I can create relationships that are healthy and open and honest and thorough and loving and helpful. And and, and the way I do that is by being that, you know, if you gave Steven another 15 minutes, he could tell you about a lot of my flaws. I'm not, I'm not here. Perfect. I have plenty of flaws and, and I don't always practice what I preach and I'm not perfect. And, and sometimes things that I ask him to do, I may not do. And I need to own that and I need to accept that. And that's part of practicing these principles, right? But one thing I will do is I will give you 110% every day, all day. I will give you as much as I can. And I believe because I've been touched, not special, just touched by the program. And that's what I mean with, with, with being young. Like, again, like it, alcoholism will hit you no matter what age you are. It doesn't discriminate, but this program will also hit you. And that was my experience. I, I would have killed myself if I didn't find alcohol. Like I truly believe alcohol saved my life, you know, because all I thought about was homicide and suicide when I was young, but I feel like alcohol really saved my life. But then alcohol took me over like much of us here. So when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I needed a bigger phenomenon, something bigger than alcohol. And what do you think that phenomenon was? It was the higher power. And how did I get that higher power? I didn't write it down on a piece of paper. I didn't go hang out on the beach and find it floating in the water. I went through the 12 steps. I wanted to do certain things. I thought about certain things prior to those steps, but it was those steps that always brought me. The biggest thing I regret in in my early sobriety not doing sooner was asking God for the power. There were so many things I realized in my sobriety that I could have attained or achieved or let go of if I just asked for the power, you know, and it says it crystal clear. We quote the steps all the time. It says it crystal clear in our 11th step. It talks about asking, uh, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and asking the power to carry that out. And until I really embraced that principle, along with the other steps, a lot of things weren't possible. Why am I talking about this? Because I'm sitting here with my stepson carrying the message. None of that was possible until I started asking for the power because I couldn't even hold a relationship in AA. I couldn't show up on time for work. I couldn't register my vehicle. And I can go on and on and on and on. Like I I didn't, I couldn't stop smoking, you know, like whatever the case is. And, And you don't have to stop smoking to be a good member of AA. I'm just making a point. Like for me, like it's something I wanted to stop, but I couldn't. Sound familiar? I wanted to stop, but I couldn't. You know, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous not because I wanted or needed it. I was licked, and God brought me here. 
Because so many times I wanted to stop and I couldn't. So many times I needed to stop and I couldn't. There were so many experiences I've had coming out of treatment centers or, or youth detention centers or different facilities, swearing to a God I didn't even believe in that I was done, promising my mother yet again that I would never do this again, telling the probation officer or the police, give me one more chance. And, and the very next thought was how I was going to get that alcohol. And the very next action was getting that alcohol. My mother drove a couple of states away to come pick me up as I was getting out of jail. She stayed at a hotel the night before where a guy was murdered. These are the kinds of things that I put her through because of my alcoholism. She drives. She stays in this hotel. She shows up to pick me up. I come out of the courtroom probably embarrassing her because I'm in my browns because uh, the correctional officer stole my clothes. And I walk right past her. And I go to the payphone. Anyone here remember one of those? You guys know what a payphone is? I walked right past her and went to the payphone to call someone so I can drink. I didn't even say thank you to my mother. Selfishness is just fascinating. So many times I was so mad at my mother for so many things. And I speak of my mom because I came into the rooms, don't forget, at 19. So my alcoholism was all in my, you know, younger years and teenage years. But I was so mad at my mother for so many things. And as I matured as a person, but most importantly, matured in understanding my condition of alcoholism and understanding my, my uh, uh, condition after working the steps, what a hypocrite. I mean, I demanded what I was unwilling to give. I was so demanding, and I was unwilling to give it. A story that's so simple but told me so much is I was so mad at one of my friends. I, I, you know, I was playing softball in early sobriety. I was one of those guys who didn't have a job, didn't have a place to live, but wanted to haircut a girlfriend and to be on the softball team. And somehow I got that. I got the girlfriend, the haircut, and the softball team. I don't know how. But so the guy was supposed to pick me up. We were going to go to the softball game. And he was a couple of minutes late. And I was screaming and yelling at him for being late. And after I had realized that and worked a 10 step and made amends, it just, it also dawned on me. I would tell my mother, I'll be right back. And I'd be gone for two weeks. And here I was mad at someone for being a couple minutes late. So like, these are the lessons I needed to learn when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, because I didn't have the capacity. I was constitutionally incapable of being honest with myself. I didn't understand truly how selfish I was, how truly self-seeking, dishonest and frightful I was. So I needed to look at all that stuff over and over and over and over again in those inventory, uh, in the steps. What I love about it, our family, when we're at our best, when we're at our worst, we tell each other, work your own program, leave me alone. But when we're at our best, we, we find stuff in our inventory and we share it with each other. We discuss it with each other. We ask for experience with each other. We point things out with each other. I can remember feeling so alone growing up, not only because of what it was like to be alcoholic and what it was like in my mind, but, you know, self-centeredness isn't just, I'm going to eat all the cookies. You know, self-centeredness is also, I'm sitting there doing nothing but thinking about myself. So I can talk myself into a panic attack. I can talk myself into suicide. I can talk myself into drinking, right? Like even when I swore I wasn't going to drink. So I grew up like just, I didn't have anybody to talk to. Some of that was probably on my family. Some of that was on me, right? But, but, but I think what we have in the house today is we have the ability to share what we're afraid of, share what we're keeping a secret so we don't have to hold on to it, you know? Share, share something that was bothering us earlier. I mean, how many times have you murdered someone in your head, but yet you won't even talk to them and say, dude, you drank the last lemonade but yet you've, you've killed the person five times in your head, right? Like that's not healthy, or at least I've learned it's not for me. I guess I won't speak for you, but that's not healthy. So it's okay to have that conversation. It's okay to, to, for, for Stephen to confront his, his mom or his stepdad. We've, we've made that possible, you know, because we want to have an open and honest relationship. Some of my best teachers like, like, for example, my father, I've only seen him five times in my life, but he's, he's a phenomenal teacher. He taught me everything not to be. But I wasn't able to see that lesson until I made amends to him for the one thing I did to him. 
because I drank the poison every time expecting him to die. Drank the poison expecting him to die. I almost threw my life away so many times because of the anger I had for a man who only showed up for me five times. I'm, I'm, I'm mature enough now to understand because of these steps, because of this program, that that doesn't have to be the way it goes. That I can be strong and not dominated. And I can, and again, what does that have to do with? Well, you know, I had the opportunity to be everything to Steven that I didn't have. And, and I don't know if, if I'm getting an A plus or not, but, but I do know I give 110%. You know, and, and a lot of those things that happen to me, I don't ever want, you know, to happen to, to Steven. You know, and, 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 and so I, I behave accordingly. I ask God for the power. One of my uh, eight emails, you remember those days where we would just get spam via the mailbox, but now we have emails and then you have to create another email so that you don't get spam and another email to hold your passwords and another email for business and blah, blah, blah. But one of my eight emails is, uh, uh, well, I won't say because it's recorded, but one of my emails has in the email uh, 400 times a day. And what that means is I talk to God at least 400 times a day. And most people, when they hear that, probably think I'm full of crap or I'm crazy or they do it themselves. But the thing is, for me, understanding where I'm at today, 400 times a day is not enough. I think of myself a million times a day. But I try to connect with that higher power with everything before we come on here and speak, before I hang out with the dogs, before I cook a meal, before I get in the car and drive with people, before I get on the train, before I get in the bus, before I get in the plane, before I work with a sponsee, before I speak at a meeting, before I call my sponsor, when I'm about to go into the doctor's office, when I'm in the emergency room, terrified, you name it. One thing I lost because of these 12 steps was the ability to complain and be a victim. I mean, in the past in the past year, I've had, let's see, COVID, a uh, couple of different kidney stones, a couple of procedures, surgery, um, been to the ER like eight times in the past couple of months. Some of my sponsees don't even know that happened. You know, and I'm, I'm not saying that as a badge. Let me get to the point here. Is because when we're focused on the solution, when we're focused on asking for the help we need, that's not as much of a priority. Don't get me wrong. There's a couple of people on this call that know that happened and I was afraid and it hurt. It was painful. I'm human. I get it. But I'm just saying like, I used to live my life where a friend of a friend of a friend of a neighbor's son died and it was all about me. You know what I mean? I don't have to make it all about me anymore. I go through things and I go through that process with God, good or bad. You know, a friend of mine was speaking at my home group the other day and, and she said something that was very, very reminiscent of my early sobriety, which was that she fell in love with God. And that was my experience through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Like when I played music, I no longer thought about my ex-girlfriend and what could have been. I thought about God. I wasn't so dependent on people anymore. I didn't turn songs on and was necessarily, not that it's a bad thing to be reminded of stuff, but, but I thought about God. And God wasn't a female. God wasn't a male. I mean, God was indescribably wonderful and larger than any of that and was just the source that I tap into. My relationship with my higher power really is that simple today. If I don't plug in, I don't get the power. If you ask me about my higher power, I'll just direct you towards the TV or the blender. And I'll say, go ahead and start the blender without being plugged in. Go ahead and turn the TV on without being plugged in. It's not possible. But once you plug in, everything's possible at that point. And that's my experience. But I don't have that without those steps. You know, Steve, Steven talked about trying to find a sponsor. And, and early on in, in AA, I had some bad experiences with Alcoholics Anonymous and the people that wanted to be in a leadership role. Um, but then I finally found that person who was going to share their experience, strength and hope with me. And I felt very blessed to have the sponsors I've had, to have the home groups I've had. I mean, I've, I've been a member of home groups where five people would stand for GSR. And you were very disappointed if you got alternate GSR. You know, I, I come from a home group where 30 of us would go out on a Friday night to a detox and carry the message. And then we go to the diner 
talk about how we were going to try to improve our lives this week. I come from sponsorship where we talk about traditions and concepts and we implement them into our groups, our home groups, our business meetings, and we implement them into our sponsorship. Um, I try to sponsor in a way where, of course, I love the big book, but I love all the big book. I love the stories in the big book, the experience, strength, and hope. I love page 561, which is about unity and the traditions, 570s, which has your concepts. I love all the big book. I love the part of the big book that tells you other A literature that's available. I love all the big book. The preface and the forwards. Some of the most powerful things in, in, in that big book is the preface and the forwards. It tells you who we are and where we came from and how we got here and how important those traditions are. And, and when I read those when I was new, uh, even though I couldn't even tell you what these words meant, so I wasn't thinking that way, but just to see that AA was a movement and there was integrity and it was in many different countries and many different people were involved. And then you crack open that book, Alcoholics Anonymous Comes of Age, and you hear about people in Alaska finding a frozen big book and starting AA. You hear about a bartender that's not even a member of Alcoholics Anonymous helping 12-step people while he's serving drinks so that AA can start in Chicago. You hear about a couple in Ireland. This one gets me every time. A couple went to visit Ireland, and instead of going on their vacation, they helped start AA. And, and that is my experience since I found a sponsor, got in a home group, and went through these 12 steps. It's not about me anymore. I've been on vacation, and my whole vacation has ended up rescuing dogs and bringing dogs back to where I live. That wasn't the plan. You know, I, I, I show up as God asked me to, you know, and, and it's just, it's just my experience um, with Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, and sponsorship and 12 steps to, to be something other than me. Think about Bill. None of us would be on this call right now. Bill was going out West for himself. Bill was going to get money. He was broke. Bill wanted a business venture. Bill was digging into something that would benefit him. He was not thinking about anybody else, but then he didn't have a choice when he was about to drink. Right. And you guys know the rest of the story for the most part. Right. So like that's, that's, that seems to be a common theme when we look at our history, when we, when we keep ourselves in a position of being other centered. And that's how I try to operate within my family. I think that's how Steven tries to operate these days. My wife, like, you know, what can I bring to the table? How can I pack into the stream of life? Am I being kind and loving? What can I do better? You know, what, what can I do for you? Early on in sobriety, you, if you go into there as a solution, uh, I forget my pages these days, but I think it's page 21, um, where it talks about the, the constant thought of others. I used to stop at the constant thought of others, and I was a hero at the constant thought of others because I thought about how to control you. I thought about how angry I was at you. I thought about what I can get from you. But then the rest of the sentence made sense to me after I went through the steps. The constant thought of others and how I can help meet their needs. I stopped praying for myself years ago. When I'm sick, I pray that others get well. When I'm broke, I pray that others get money. When I'm angry, I pray that others find peace of mind. Everything I do today from my phone to my car to my house to my backyard there's a large piece of how I can help somebody when any of those purchases are made. My clothes, my food, my interactions with Stephen's teachers, my interactions with Stephen. How can I be helpful? Not just what can I get. I don't go to the store just for me anymore. Not much anyway. I'm still self-centered, but, but not much. That's the scary part. I'm not going to do comparison games. But again, I promise you, I work this thing 110%, but I still fall short. And there's still self-centeredness that I'm blind to until someone makes me aware. Sponsor, Steven, Marissa, friends. That strange mental blank spot, whether it's a drink or a think. And that's why I know I need this program so bad. That's why it might be just so insane for me not to work the steps. So insane. I really, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound like a martyr, but I'm really nothing without the program. Um, I, I do a, a bunch of things okay, above average. You know, I can give you the list some other time of what those things are, but, but something I do really well is show up for Alcoholics Anonymous, participate at a meeting, get involved in service, deal with committees, 
You know, that's that's what I do very well. And and what's really cool about that is I don't have to worry about being the best because in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's no second class citizen and we're all created equal. That's why we have anonymity. That's why we have principles before personalities, because we're not publishing people. We're publishing principles. And we all have that opportunity. Again, we respect people and hey, nothing wrong with that. We, we, we see leaders. I have people that I looked up to and, and, and I'm sure some folks look up to me and, and, you know, that's the way it works. And I get it. But the thing is, everybody can have this. It's not just the people that live in that neighborhood. We're not just the people that dress that way. Everybody can get drunk and everybody can also get sober and be free. Will they? I don't know. But we all have that opportunity. And that makes me feel so connected to you. Because even as selfish as I am, I really don't want to go into that neighborhood in my head where I need to compare and be better or worse than. It's so exhausting. It's so exhausting, that neighborhood. I just want to be a part of. I just want to be a worker among workers, you know? I just want to be a member among members. Um, I am a type A personality, and I will go for leadership. Absolutely. It's the way I operate. But I want to just be a part of. I want to think about the altruistic movement of Alcoholics Anonymous in, in my daily affairs. I want to think about how I can be altruistic within my family because of what I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous in my daily affairs. Again, Stephen and I, I mean, we, we couldn't even have an honest conversation until the steps. Like when I tell you it was literally the steps that brought us to have honest communication. It was literally the steps that brought us to uh, recover from where we were. It was literally the steps that guided us to be able to help others. You know, many times, I mean, we, you know, me, my mom, my wife, Stephen, we've spoken on panels at conventions and, you know, it, 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 it seems pretty cool, right? Because here's a whole slate of family members that are sober and recovery, Al-Anon, al AA, and, you know, but I don't ever want to forget about the person whose family is not interested in their sobriety or whose husband cannot get sober or whose son just can't get this. So I think it's really important to be an example of how a family can recover. But I also think it's important to mention that we as individuals can be happy regardless of what our family is doing, our brother or son, you know, alcoholism brings you to some, you know, sobriety brings you to some interesting spots with human beings. I was talking to a mom, let's see, since it was COVID, so it was probably four years ago now, maybe three, three, four years ago, I was talking to a mother. Whenever I speak at an Al-Anon anniversary, I get a whole bunch of mothers asking for my number and they want me to fix their, their children for them, right? And I'm just like, yeah, that's not happening. But I can introduce you to some folks in Al-Anon and you can have your own first step experience, right? But, but of course, I don't talk to them exactly that way. But, um, but anyway, this particular woman... Um, you know, she had lost her second child in, in a couple of months. Both, both of her kids were, you know, running and gunning. And I said to her, I said, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry for your losses. And she's like, I'm glad it's finally over. And some people would think that's crazy. Your kids just died. But that's where alcoholism takes us to a point where a mom is just exhausted. She couldn't function in the world anymore. She didn't know whether to leave you alone or to help you or to set you free. Or, and, and she finally has relief because those two individuals have, have passed. That's not a conversation you have at the cafeteria at school. You know, That's not something you, you, you talk about at the bus stop or in the line at DMV. Only those who have suffered from alcohol understand that. Like, I didn't judge her for that. I didn't say like, oh my God, you don't love your kids. I understood it. Because I know what it's like to do that to my mother, and I know what it's like to have that done by, by other friends who are, who are out and about. Again, sobriety in AA will bring you to some places. There's an education that's priceless. It really is. We learn the tools of how to be about in this world. You know, so practicing these principles in all our affairs is a very deep topic. It's not just sponsorship. It's not just being involved with the group. It's everything. The entire program of AA, the entire family structure, the work structure, because that's where we carry the message too, right? The eighth step for me is one of the most important steps because we're taking that time 
to look at what we've done and all of our relationships. And by getting through to the next part of the process, in my experience, gives us the opportunity to carry the message. I only have nine minutes left, but so many of my amends have later turned out to me having the opportunity to carry the message to a family member, an employee, a friend of a family, a family member of a family, because that's what we do. They saw us when we were running and gunning, and now we have the opportunity. We have, we've been given the power to show something different. That's my experience. That may not be everybody's experience, but it's mine. So I look at amends as opportunities to carry the message. No, I'm not under some belief that I'm going to apologize and look at how you know, great my apology is. But what I'm trying to say is I, I can be a demonstration. If you ask me, you know, Craig, how, 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 do you, how do you become a leader in service in AA? You be honest with those you serve. You say you don't know when you don't, and you admit when you're wrong. Sure, I can speak well. I can do a lot of work. I can get the, the commitment done. But, but let them know that you'll meet them exactly where they're at. You're an alcoholic just like they are. You're wrong just like they are. You know? It says in, our, in our, one of our favorite, most quoted pages, or at least a lot of us read it at the end of our meetings, in a vision for you, uh, you know, we can't give away what we don't have. Like, we, we remember that, right? Uh, for the man who is still sick. I'm, I'm the person they're talking about. When we read page 164 and we're talking about the person who is still sick, it's not just the newcomer, it's me. You know, and I'm not making it about me, I'm making it mutually inclusive in the sense that I still need to work a program. I'm not cured. I still need to be sponsored. I still need to dive deeper into those traditions and concepts. I need to make myself available after rotation. I don't just do a commitment and I'm done. You know? we, we can't give away what we don't have, but we also can give away what we do have because that's the only ticket that's of any value in AA. You could tell me all the opinions you want about carpentry, politics, you know, technology, whatever you want, that has nothing to do with AA. What matters in AA is our experience, strength, and hope, which again makes us equal. And we all have something to offer. We have, we have a really, um, I think, um, great home group. And one of the cool things about our group is, you know, we, we give everyone a, an opportunity to participate. But we do have someone in that group who's kind of newer to AA. Um, and, and she's been with us about six months. And, and, and you know, she, she's our, um, she has a service position. But I, I just love the way she shares. Because she just talks about where she's at. Even though she hasn't finished her fourth step yet, she has so much to offer in those first three steps she has done. That's what we used to do at my old home group. We would go out and we'd have three speakers, right? We'd have the first speaker who was in their first 90 days and the other two speakers were experienced speakers. Sometimes in AA, we don't want to hear you. We, 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 we tell you, shut up unless you've been through the steps. You're, you're not allowed to share unless you've been through the steps. Why? What's more important than a newcomer talking about how they just found a sponsor, they just got a home group, they're working on that first step, and they're getting to that possibility of reaching out and coming to believe. Why would we want to take that away? I love hearing from the person who hasn't been through the steps yet. Don't misquote me, though. Of course, I want to talk about the steps. Of course, we want to carry the message of the steps. But I love hearing from the member who just got through their fourth step and, and isn't sure how to even make the appointment with their sponsor on the fifth step. But all that experience they have with those first four steps is so valuable. you know. But again, it comes down to open, honest, and willing. You know? If we just share our experience, strength, and hope, it's beautiful. If I talk to you where I'm at, there's nothing wrong with that. And I love that. I love that. I love the A member that has been around for 30 years and has traveled and has served as a delegate and been to this country and saw A here and that. I love it. I love the person who's well in, involved in the general service structure, the person who's worked at the general service office, the trustee. I love it. I do. But I also love that individual. We had a guy at our home group speak recently from, from Mexico. He, he came on and, and he's back again. 
and and I'm the speaker seeker right now. And when I asked him, he's like, "Oh, I haven't been I haven't been through the steps yet, and and I'm just back, and I'm not here long." I said, "Perfect. I want you to share your experience, strength, and hope, because I know the group's going to be fine." He shares for 15 minutes of where he's at. He talks about how he cannot get it, but here he is again working on it, and he's got a sponsor and he's got a home group. And then we have the other hour of many other members who have the opportunity to talk about the steps. You know, I don't want to get preachy, but sometimes we get rigid. We get so rigid, you know, but I love the steps. I love the traditions. I love the concepts. I don't know any other way to function in AA. If I'm at a home group business meeting, I don't know any other way to function than using the 12 traditions. If I'm at a district meeting, an area meeting, a general service conference, and functioning within the general service structure, I don't know any way else to function other than traditions and concepts. There's no other way to function. And my life today, I don't know any other way to function than to use the 12 steps. Home, work, family, grocery store, uh, pool, you name it. I used to ask God to show me, but I forgot to trust. I would always ask God to show me, and then I'd spend the whole day complaining to my sponsor that God never showed me. But then when I opened my eyes, I realized he was always showing me. I was just trying to run the show. I remember working, um, I was probably 20, uh, I don't know, early 20s, and I was working at a car place, and uh, I asked God to make me useful. Please make me useful. I'm so tired of thinking of myself. And this was a new job that I had just gotten. And, you know, where I was living at the time was a lot of gangs, and, and there was two rival gangs, employees that worked at the same place, and they were fighting every day. I was like a referee at work. And they would bring their posse in and they would fight out in the back and cops involved. Like, it was crazy. Like, I'm supposed to be managing a store. And, and meanwhile, I'm a referee. And, and I'd call my sponsor and I'd be like, this stuff doesn't work. Every time I ask God to show me how to be useful, there's a problem. And he said, well, maybe there's your opportunity to be useful, Craig. And so I started to take that perspective. Believe it or not, I carried a message to two, two of those three people. One guy I'm still in the contact with today. God gives us the power and the opportunity to, to create change. When we ask him, he shows up. If you've been through the amends process and then you're on this call, you understand what I mean. Because there's you write this list of people you haven't seen in years, people you haven't talked to in years. And you think to yourself, before you go through the process, how am I ever going to do this? And all of a sudden, these people are showing up. I remember I, I, remember I had a friend who I knew from New York who I was going through the amends, who is now living in Maryland. I haven't talked to him. I'm in Maryland, and there he is. You know, I used, I used to say words like unbelievable. I don't say it anymore because everything's so believable. I used to say words like coincidence. I don't say it anymore, you know? But I only believe that stuff because of listening to, you know, People like Stephen tell his story today. I knew where Stephen was at not too many years ago. I'll let him tell you, but I knew where he's at, where he's at now. And he shared the same sentiment. People that couldn't stop drinking and where they are now. It's an opportunity to be, be an example. Um, I was very politically charged. I know I got two minutes here. I was very politically charged when I came to AA. I wanted to change the world, but meanwhile, I couldn't change myself. And but one thing that always stuck with me was I didn't like this world we lived in. It's such a cold world, the way we treat other people, you know, countries at war, uh, starvation, the way we treat animals. Like, like that's something that's always on my inventory. Like I have such a broken heart with, with humanity and the way we operate. What I find in the democratic movement of Alcoholics Anonymous and the altruism of, altruism of Alcoholics Anonymous is that peace I'm looking for. Because there's equality here when we help create it. There's a message of hope and recovery here when we help create it. Families who don't talk to each other for 30 years and are at war now have barbecues together. Like, so I get that from AA. You know, I don't have to go out and, 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 and change the world. I just have to practice these principles right here at home, right here at the home group. And then the change takes care of itself. I watch all of those things change by showing up here. 
I had no family, and now look at the family I have. I had no father, but now I have the opportunity to be a father. Stephen said he didn't really feel like he had a father figure, and now he has seven of them. You know, it's like these are the kinds of things that happen when we, when we work this program. And uh, I still have a lot of work to do. Even, even, even as I sit here and I'm communicating, I can think of things that, that I can prove on my relationship with, with Stephen. I can improve on my relationship with my home group, um, you know, how I share. But that's a good thing. There's more work to do. And I can keep showing up to do that. Um, so, again, what an honor to speak at any A meeting, but definitely an honor to be able to share experience, strength, and hope, um, you know, with, with my stepson and, and, and my family. So thank you for having us today. We appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.